Good evening and welcome to Talk of the Neighborhoods. I'm Joe Heisler, your host, coming to you from the BNN Live Studios, Eggleston Square, Jamaica Plain, where tonight on the Boston Neighborhood Network, well, we'll bring you a, a usual dose of politics, as is our usual want. Uh, tonight, the state and local variety. First up tonight, uh, state politics. Of course, uh, last Tuesday's primary election selected the nominees for the Republican and Democratic Party, and of course, a lot of coverage of that. But lost in that coverage is the fact that there's three independent candidates that are also on the ballot this November. What impact they will have on the race? Well, it's uh, perhaps too early to tell. Tonight, of course, uh, BNN, its policy and its beliefs in uh, equal time, joining us one of those independent candidates from Springfield, Mass. He is a minister, a author, an attorney, a self-described social conservative, uh, running for governor, and Reverend Scott Lively joins us, and we'll find out what got him into this race and what he hopes to accomplish. Then in the second half, we'll shift gears to some local politics. Of course, when Mayor Menino was in office, the Boston Redevelopment Authority board was little more than a rubber stamp for his decisions on developing, especially the downtown area of Boston. Well, since Marty Walsh has taken over as mayor, he's promised to shake up the BRA. Tonight, his first new appointee to that board, he's a man uh, made famous by a rather tragic incident 40 years ago when he was uh, speared by an anti-busing protester with an American flag, a photo that won the Pulitzer Prize. Ted Landsmark has gone on to become a renowned expert in architecture, development, and now he is on the Boston Redevelopment Authority board. Uh, he'll be joining us as well. All that and more tonight on Talk of the Neighborhood. Joe Heiser, your host tonight, two-part show in this first half state politics and uh, there's been a little more on the, our minds and on the front pages of papers lately. How could you miss it? Last week's state primary election, of course, uh, the turnout was, uh, well, not a record low, but very close. Uh, nonetheless, uh, two nominees, uh, Charlie Baker, the uh, Republican nominee, handily winning his race to become, uh, to uh, continue on to November, and Martha Coakley, well, she didn't quite squeak by, but a much closer race than the polls indicated. She is the Democratic nominee, but lost in much of that coverage, much of that discussion uh, in the November election. There are three other candidates on the ballot, three independent candidates, and tonight I'm pleased to have one of them joining us. Uh, he is a, uh, a minister, a... Uh, author and attorney from Springfield, Mass, and a man who was uh, not afraid to uh, share his opinions, uh, whether they're controversial or not. I'm pleased to have him joining us, though. Uh, Reverend Scott Lively is here. Nice to have you here. Thanks so much Great for coming in all the way from uh, Springfield to join us. Well, let's start out with this. In the, uh, arguably, the bluest of bluest states, uh, yeah. Uh, with no history of electing independents, uh, uh, what, 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 gets, what gets you into this race? What is it that made you decide to put your name on the ballot and put up with sometimes the outrageous slings and arrows of uh, campaign politics? Well, I'm used to slings and arrows. Uh, I'm, I've been a long-time Christian social activist, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that, uh, that sort of prepares you for the political realm. Mm -hmm. I'm running to advance a biblical worldview uh, in the political arena here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that hasn't really heard those ideas articulated in a long time. Uh, I grew up in uh, Shelburne Falls. I was born and raised there in the, in the mm -hmm. village. Western Mass. Western Mass, a bridge of flowers and, and, uh, and all that. Yeah. And uh, the uh, Massachusetts that I remember as a child uh, and growing up is very different and so much better than what we have now. And I think the change, the dramatically uh, weakening of our, of our values uh, has produced uh, a lot of serious problems and it, that can be fixed just simply by restoring uh, this, the kind of cultural consensus that we had 
back in the 40s and 50s. Well, <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit more about your your your, your views, but uh, what what's uh, let's go back to uh, what got you into this. I mean, what what do you hope to accomplish? Do you see yourself? Uh, um, are you a protest candidate? Are you a spoiler? I think you you would uh, acknowledge yourself that you're uh, uh, a bit of a long shot given that you know the history of electoral politics here in Massachusetts. But uh, uh, how did you go into this? I mean, did oh. you? What would you uh, consider a success in this race? Well, let me just say I, I was uh, I left 30 years ago. Well, I left in, in 1977. I was gone for 30 years. When I came back. Uh, I was really shocked at the state of things Went here in Massachusetts. Went to where? Where'd you go? Well, I was mostly on the West Coast, but all over the world. I've been okay. to 40 countries, yeah. uh, and uh, I've had a really amazing in, experiences. In a social ministry type of uh, ministry Various type things. Well, I've had role. four careers in my life, and uh, uh, one of them is, uh, is an attorney in Southern California. I've been a human rights consultant and activist mm -hmm. all over the world. Uh, but anyways, I came back here and was really, uh, really disappointed so uh, that, that the, the Massachusetts seems to be a one-party state, Democrat. Mm -hmm. And even the Republican Party is Democrat. And uh, there, there's really no one that represents value voters. So, uh, and the, the, the longer that we go without having someone articulating uh, those perspectives so that people understand you know, that there is a biblical worldview to, mm -hmm. to these issues, uh, then, the, then the further we get from being able to restore them. When, uh, the, the electorate in Massachusetts is conditioned uh, from all these decades of, of having uh, only liberal candidates. They're conditioned to thinking that those are the only ideas. So uh, that are, uh, another are. voice, at least, uh, whether it's in the wilderness or not. Uh, you say value voters. Uh, how would you define them, and, and how, how many are those? Is, is that a? Well, uh, is it a enough that? Uh, 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 Scott Lively, the votes uh, you get uh, might prevent one or the other of the major party candidates or one of the other independent candidates, yeah, if they should get that close, from winning? Well, uh, you know, my, my primary objective is to articulate these values mm -hmm. and to give people someone right. to vote for yeah. that has values. But my second objective is to prevent Charlie Baker from winning. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Baker is a, is a rhino, uh, Republican in name only. I would be running as a Republican if the state Republican Party uh, was, wasn't so corrupt. Uh, but I'm running as an independent to advocate the values that the Republican Party holds at its base and to provide those, uh, those voters at the base someone to vote for. You say corrupt, though. What, what, you, you I mean, morally, uh, how, how, morally how, how, corrupt. Morally, morally corrupt. corrupt. The, the number one <laughs> issue, I believe, in any election anywhere in the United States is life. It's the sanctity of human life. And, and, and it's my view that no one who is willing to kill any innocent unborn baby is fit for public office. If you, you can't get that one right. And you're talking about candidates that support uh, abortion, right. Uh, right. contraception? Uh, you well, it's, uh, I believe in, in the natural family. It, uh, you know, biblically speaking, God gave us a standard to live by. I'm a, I'm a pastor, yeah. and I, I advocate this all over the world. Uh, Genesis 127 says that we're created in His image, male and female, complementary halves of one whole. And in Genesis 2:24 uh, it says, "Therefore shall a man leave his family and cleave unto his wife, and they will become one flesh." Okay. That one flesh paradigm is the only uh, place for sexuality from a biblical worldview. Everything outside of that is 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 wrong and harmful. And I agree that uh, maybe 30 years ago, maybe more, uh, you know, that might have been a prevailing view. But uh, right. and you know whether people agree or not. Uh, and well, it, the question it's is, a, why, it's a why much, isn't it anymore? Yes, yes. But it's a and and I want to talk about that. But I want to talk about numbers first, uh -huh. uh, votes specifically. Yeah. Uh, are there value voters yet? I mean, as you well, describe you know, look them, at I the, mean... Uh, look at how many people signed the petition uh, to put gay marriage on the ballot. That was uh, several years ago mm -hmm. now. And they, of course, got robbed. Uh, by that's uh, that's uh, the whole question of whether it should be uh, legal, repealed, right. repealed yeah. uh, legal in Massachusetts. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, there was, there was an enormous, enormous turnout mm -hmm. uh, in terms of people signing that petition. And that indicates there's a pretty good... Uh, and, and the other question is, why are there only... 33% of the registered voters Democrat and 12% Republican. Mm -hmm. I think it's because the, the majority, what, 53 or 54% are independent. Why? 
because they're fed up. They don't like the choices that they get. Mm -hmm. But every election, it's the same thing over, over and over again, especially for the people of conservative values. It's the lesser of two evils. Well, what, are you, what are you hearing out there? Are you, sir, uh, and and uh, I'm not making light of this, but because uh, uh, I, I don't hear it, and I'm, right. I'm being a little devil's advocate here, no pun intended. Well, I don't have much money. That's my problem. I don't have much money. But are you getting a sense are, are, are that uh, people are you know, uh, coming to your cause? Uh, do you well, I'm, you know, the pioneers take the arrows, and that's re really where I am. I'm, I am stepping out to articulate these values and views after a long period of time when they haven't been articulated. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not likely that there's going to be vast numbers of people, you know, jumping on this bandwagon. Mm -hmm. But the fact that, that someone w has the courage to stand up and articulate them, it resonates with people. And that I think it will inspire other people to follow the example. That, if, if, if nothing else, if I accomplish that, then that will be positive. And that people will have a chance to hear the reasoning behind the conservative positions. And that's something you never, even when, the, even when a conservative candidate steps forward, somebody like Mark Fisher. And I, re, I supported Mark Fisher. Right, yeah. I think he's a good guy. Yeah. But he wasn't a champion of the, of the values. Won approximately 25% of whatever percentage of the Republicans had voted. Right. And it was, you know, that it's a disgraceful how few people. Why do so few people uh, come out to vote? in the primary and in the general. Why? Well, I you, think they're fed up. <clears throat> you know, and I, and I want to ask you about this because you've, you've traveled all over the country and mm -hmm. uh, certainly in uh, other parts of the country, in a lot of different parts of the country, the Republican Party is much more conservative, right. much more socially right. conservative. Mm -hmm. What happened here in your I think it was the what Kennedys. I think it was the Kennedys. The Kennedys. I think it was the Kennedys. How, how who took so? Us down. I, I, I want to hear that. Well, I think I think the Kennedy family was started out uh, with with uh, with uh, John Kennedy. Yeah. yeah. As yeah. Uh, he was he was pretty fiscally conservative. I think today he would probably be right of center, mm -hmm. uh, almost certainly yeah. on almost anything. Yeah. I think he, he was solidly pro life. Uh, uh, that uh, you know, but the the rest of the family, right? When it when it fell to to a Teddy Kennedy. Uh, and the enormous power that he wielded, uh, he, he moved the whole state to the left. He's the guy, really, who mm -hmm. blocked the gay marriage vote. He put the squeeze on all the, uh, and, and, the legislators. And what, what about in the Republican Party, though? Traditionally, uh, you know, somewhat mm -hmm. usually more conservative, certainly fiscally conservative, but oftentimes socially as well. Right. Well, I look what, back. What happened there? Well, the, it, the media uh, is, the, is the big problem with the Republicans. Uh, the Republicans have are conditioned to sort of ducking and running uh, from the gaff patrol, right, that, uh, that the media, use, the media will look for anything they can. If you want to go philosophically what happened to our whole society across America, and especially in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. it's a phenomenon called cultural Marxism. Herbert Marcuse, the, the Frankfurt School of Cultural Marxism out of Germany just before World War II, uh, he came over, began promoting uh, his whole radical uh, ideas which were adopted by the the, the 60s uh, generation. Uh, it, it's a it's a Marxist worldview, uh, uh, grounded and and uh, and focused on cultural social issues rather than mm -hmm. economic ones. And the media was one of the first institutions really to fall into that way of thinking. And so the, you know the majority of newspaper reporters and television uh, reporters are very far left in their in their worldview. Mm -hmm. They're hostile to conservative values, and they make uh, Republican and conservative candidates pay the price. Well, I don't know. You know, uh, when I look at the uh, U.S. House of Representatives, and in fact, uh, you know, there's a major debate going on in this country uh, between, uh, and, and some of it, at least, mm -hmm. is driven by socially conservative views. Uh, it's, mostly, it's mostly a fiscal yeah. conservative battle But, but these certainly days. There's, uh, there's some of that. Well, and let me ask you about this. So, mm -hmm. so uh, because uh, you know, I'm reading some of your clips, and of course, you you you're famous. I found out uh, somewhat, yes, uh, in some circles. Yes, <laughs> in some circles, and and some would say infamous uh, as well. I'm, I'm sure you obviously you beg to differ, but uh, I want to ask you about this because I found it uh, fascinating that you were involved with the uh, Ugandan government mm -hmm. in helping them to write legislation. Well, that, well actually, no. Is that that's incorrect? the accusation. That's the accusation. Yes. Okay, no. help well, us. See, I, I, I have been all over the world yeah. advocating the biblical view of sexuality, yeah. that all sex belongs inside of marriage, mm -hmm. 
and that, uh, and that uh, social policy should, should actively discourage sex outside of marriage. And the, 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 the battle, as it stands right mm -hmm. now, the, the hottest part of the battlefield is regarding homosexuality. So we, we already lost the battle regarding the sanctity of marriage uh, itself, you know, divorce, no-fault divorce that came in, uh, a lot of those issues. But the battle at, today is it's the, over homosexuality trending into transgender and transsexuality trending into polyamory. And uh, so... Uh, well, you, you've been, and fairly or no, again, uh, you described as a... And I think in your literature, you, you talk about uh, gay marriage and you opposed in Absolutely. the simplest yeah. uh, uh, terms. But uh, uh, I, I did find that interesting. Somehow, tell us about that experience uh, or role that you might have had in what happened in Uganda and, well, I've been and indeed in mm -hmm. Russia as well. Mm -hmm. Did I read right. that correctly? Uh, well, that uh, you helped uh, uh, them forge or well, develop legislation that uh, essentially uh, prohibited uh, gay relationships and well, gay no, marriage. no. Well, that's that's once again that's that's a little bit skewed. What, what me, I did, I did I, in in uh, 2006, 2007, I did a 50 city tour of the former Soviet Union across eight countries. Mm -hmm. and I was lecturing in universities. I was speaking with uh, government officials. Uh, uh, giving conferences, that sort of this thing. This is before the breakup yeah. of the Soviet Union? No, no, no. After? Yeah, the breakup goes back to 1991. Like, 91. Yeah. Uh, so this is much, much later. Yeah. But uh, uh, so I was in, you know, I was in Russia, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, mm -hmm. Belarus, mm -hmm. Ukraine, etc. Yeah. Uh, and uh, everywhere I went, I was, I was warning the people of, the East, of Eastern Europe and Russia uh, what's happened to our country in, at the hands of the, the gay activist movement and the dramatic transformation of culture and values that's taken place regarding sexuality and the negative consequences that's had. And uh, so what I was suggesting to them, the number one policy uh, goal that they said that they should pursue is to uh, uh, prevent propaganda to children, gay propaganda to children. And, uh, and then I published a letter to the Russian people in 2007 in St. Petersburg. and. Uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, actually, St. Petersburg became the first city to actually adopt mm. that uh, that very law. I wasn't right. I wasn't involved in writing it or anything. I sort of inspired it to some degree. It, it, to a large extent, it's intuitive that that's the kind of thing that you would do to protect your society. Uh, and then several other cities adopted it. Then the Russian Duma uh, signed it into law. It's now the law of the land in Russia, and it's being it's being modeled in other Eastern European countries mm -hmm. too. Uh, and, and what about Uganda? Because Uganda is a different. That's, that's yeah. gotten a lot of, and I understand yeah, you're actually being negative. sued yeah. over that. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm the first American ever to be sued for crimes against humanity. It's, I know it's, it's <laughs> a, a category of crimes invented to prosecute the Nazis for for serious war crimes. And it's it's a frivolous case that's been filed by a Marxist law firm out of New York called the Center for Constitutional Rights. Uh, they're just simply trying mm. to shut me up. Uh, all I did was preach against homosexuality in Uganda, and then the, 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 the government, the Ugandan government, or a legislator there, came out with a bill that uh, was dramatically, overly harsh. I was against it from the very beginning. I never, I had nothing to do with well, drafting I, it, and I never supported it. I was very public about right. it, but nevertheless, they and accused and me some, of being the some, master. And, in fact, you know, and uh, again, this is probably not owing to you, but uh, sometimes you start the ball rolling down the hill and it, it takes well, a life well, of no, its that's, own. No, no that's you? not true either. See, no. th th all this stuff is is sort of uh, the propaganda of the left. And they do this. They try yeah. to destroy anybody who yeah. speaks against uh, gay marriage or whatever. No, no, but, you know, yeah. the law in Uganda as it's being enforced. Yeah, but Uganda, uh, is, you have to understand, is, Uganda is a country, it's the only country in the world that actually has a national holiday celebrating the rejection of sodomy. In the 1800s, King Mwanga, uh, he, uh, he had the power to require any young man mm -hmm. or, or boy to, uh, to be his page, and he would, he would engage well, in, in let all me things I won't even talk about on TV. Now, uh, you, this is a uh, city that has a, you know, a large uh, number of uh, uh, gay, lesbian, transgendered people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so you, know, you, you might be uh, uh, cutting into your potential vote here talking about this. But, uh, I, you I know, mean, they invited I, me to their, to what, their what, debate what, 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 at what, the Boston Public yeah. Library. So. You know, some would say, um, and, you know, I, I'm a heterosexual, but, you know, what do you care? Why, why do you care whether uh, uh, 
people and the sanctity of their own. And I'm again, I'm playing you know a little what? devil's advocate. You know, I don't. Yeah. I don't. You yeah. know, and that's and see, that's lost in the discussion also. Yeah. I'm very, uh, I believe in, in individual civil liberties. Yeah. In fact, I support the original goal of the gay movement, was, which when they said that what they wanted was the right to be left alone, right? I probably leave them alone. I don't want anybody knocking down their doors, but it's a, it's a whole different thing to say you want the right to be left alone, and then you start marching through the streets down to the elementary school to pr start promoting what you do to little kids. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm against. I'm against the, the, the normalization of sexual perversion. I want us to, to have a standard in which, we, in which we uphold marriage, in which we uphold sexuality as something that belongs inside of marriage. And even though we have tolerance for people who don't necessarily agree, yeah. we ask them to be discreet about it and keep it in the privacy of their bedrooms, not, you know, not parade it in front of all of our faces all the time. But I can't imagine being a Christian, you're not a tolerant person in and right. of yourself. I've, uh, I, my yeah, sister yeah, was yeah. a lesbian. Yeah. Well, I, she yeah, came out to me as yeah, a teenager. There you right. go. Now, so what's to say, or what's you know not to say that? Hey, uh, it's now the law of the land. Uh, let's move on from this. Why, Reverend Lively, do you keep talking about this? Well, because I believe. And I think we get to the crux of right, uh, it's, your. It's, uh, your, it's uh, a uh, symptom uh, of the of the deeper problem of turning away from the standards of God. And, re and rejecting them and taking the consequences for it. Look at what has happened to America uh, since the 1960s. Right? You look at the 50s, that uh, uh, a family could, be, could live happily on one income. You could let your kids go out and play in the streets without worrying about them being raped. Right? You, there were, the standards of values were so much higher. You could leave your keys in your car and it wouldn't be stolen. Right? How did we get from there to here? It's because we stopped honoring God. We stopped following the, the, the things that he told us to do. And it's central to all of that is sexuality. Because the, 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 who, are the, who are the criminals and the, the mentally ill and the, and the, and the, 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 the addicts of, of various substances that are running in the streets? These are the product of the broken homes that, that were broken because the parents of those families started acting out in the way that, the, that, that goes against what God told us to do. Saying that's all true, assuming that's all true, do you feel like you're a voice in the wilderness? And, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you literally know, and figuratively. Uh, um, um, it is because, you know, uh, because whenever a person stands up to say anything like this, um, the, the gay bullies uh, come out to attack, to try to destroy you. From Anita Bryant all the way to Phil Robertson, any person who dares to stand up and say these things is targeted for personal but, but, destruction. And, and, and I got to ask you about this. So, but you know, even uh, even uh, Pope Francis is kind of he's caving uh, in, come isn't around, he? Oh, I, he's caving in. Is that in. what you would say? Uh, you well, know. yeah. But you know, that's is, is, the epitome of Christianity for a lot of people, a lot of voters in Massachusetts. Well, and and I granted, it comes down uh, to what the Bible says. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what any religious figure believes or thinks. It mm -hmm. comes down to what the Bible says. God gave us his word. He articulated his beliefs and values in those pages. Mm -hmm. And that uh, that's what I follow. That's what genuine Christians follow is what God says, not what any human being says. And the, the greater the pressure that there is in the world to cave in, the more people are going to do it. And then, the, so the higher the cost it is for people like me, who are not willing to compromise on those things, and the cost that uh, gets and, higher. And, for and doing whatever it. costs those are, in, even in terms of votes. But uh, yeah, well, we'll I'm stop not, you from saying what you think right. and what you believe. Principles and, uh, before politics. And I give you credit for that. Uh, Thank you, I really John. do. And uh, putting your name in the bell, and it's not an easy thing to put yourself up and have people judge you. That's true. And so uh, you, know, you get big points from me for that and for coming in and, and joining us on Talking to Neighbors. Thanks so much for Thanks coming. Thanks for having in. me in. I really appreciate I, it. I appreciate it, too. Again, uh, Reverend Scott Lively, he's a independent candidate running for governor, uh, one of five people on the ballot this November. If you haven't been paying attention before now, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's uh, uh, less than 50 days now until the November election when voters will decide who the next governor is. And uh, uh, Scott Lively is one of those candidates that will be on the ballot. Well, we'll shift gears back to city politics. And uh, very pleased to have joining me uh, uh, Mayor Marty Walsh's newest appointment 
to the Boston Redevelopment Authority Board, a man who's uh, made his mark, an expert in the field of architecture, the uh, 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 past president of the Boston Architectural College, uh, Ted Lyonsmark. Shift gears back to city politics, and of course, uh, back in the day, well, not so long ago, when the Menino administration was in power, the Boston Redevelopment Authority pretty much rubber stamped the uh, decisions, the ideas put forth by Mayor Menino. That's all changed now with the election of Mayor Marty Walsh. He's promised to shake up the BRA, and he's starting that process uh, with including the appointment of my guest tonight. He is, uh, of course, uh, uh, well known in the city of Boston for his expertise in the field of uh, architecture, law, development, uh, the, now the uh, president emeritus of the Boston Architectural College and the newest member of the Boston Redevelopment Authority Board. And I'm very pleased to have joining us, uh, Ted Lansmark. Ted? Nice, nice to, to be here. Nice to have you here, my friend. Well, let's see, uh, where shall we start? Uh, of course, uh, get any uh, directions from uh, the new mayor when he said, uh, Ted, how'd you like to be on the BRA board? <laughs> well, actually, uh, no, not yet. And um, I, I think he's uh, looking to surround himself with people who will uh, have some fresh ideas and think innovatively and uh, who have seen what's going on in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, um, and who can bring some of that here. But I will say that one of the things he said uh, early on was that Boston really does have its own identity, um, and that as much as uh, there may be interesting ideas that come from outside the city, uh, the real strength of the city is that we uh, are a city of uh, innovative people, uh, a diverse city, a city that uh, has grown uh, tremendously over the last couple of decades. It's become a lot more cosmopolitan, and uh, it's a moment for uh, people within the city uh, to really be heard on uh, what the vision and future of the city should be. And, and, and make a mark on the city. Of course, uh, you know, the city has gone through these phases, and it's always being developed, but uh, uh, certain kind of uh, periods of time where uh, uh, the face of the city has, has somewhat changed. Uh, uh, you've spent your life, you know, looking, at, talking about uh, uh, design, decisions that affect uh, uh, how skylines and uh, uh, people are, uh, uh, their place in uh, a city and society. What do you, what do you see? Uh, give us, pull out your crystal ball, Ted, and. Uh, where do you see us heading? And are we on the uh, uh, you know, the cusp of one of those new growth periods in the city of Boston? Well, of course, we're already in the midst of a period of incredible uh, development and growth. There's a huge amount of investment that has gone on really across the entire city from uh, East Boston through downtown out through... Kind uh, of the pipeline that was... Uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of things were uh, in the pipeline. Uh, the economy uh, began to uh, improve. Uh, and we see cranes everywhere around the city. And um, I know that uh, part of the concern is that there's a lot of development uh, that's going on at this moment. Um, and some of it seems kind of unfocused. It seems uh, uh, a little bit uh, like on fire. Uh, and yet, <clears throat> we haven't had a comprehensive plan for the city, a real vision for the city that ties all of the pieces together in 50 years. And so this is an interesting moment for us to uh, pause, not to stop anything, but to really take a hard look at what we want the city to be in a decade or uh, 25 years, and how we want the city to feel. What is the experience of the city going to be? We know that we have certain very clear challenges around sustainability and the rise of the sea level mm -hmm. along the coast and we need to address issues of affordable housing. But we also need to talk about public space and how design helps to build communities by helping to bring people together. We need to talk about uh, the way our waterfront, for example, doesn't always feel when you're there as though we're the kind of diverse city that we've become. We need to talk about public health issues. We need to talk about how design has a major impact on 
how people get around and whether people exercise and whether it's safe and comfortable uh, for families to be everywhere and to feel healthy uh, throughout the city. We have to talk about investment strategies that really uh, begin to uh, uh, help economic development in those neighborhoods of the city where we know we need to have more employment. We need to talk about the way our public transit system works. We need to talk about little things like signage and how people find their way around the city, even I remember, now. I remember when I first came here, there were no signs. I said, how do people find, figure out where they're at? Well, you know, you come up out of the tunnel at this moment, and you, you, you uh, are told that you can go uh, <laughs> down 90 or uh, uh, up 93, but if you don't know what 90 and 93 are, uh, it, you're lost the moment you come out of the tunnel. So there are a lot of things um, that we need to address uh, across the city. Um, and we also need to address the fact that being a city of neighborhoods, we can sometimes be a little bit insular uh, in our neighborhoods about what we want for our neighborhoods, uh, but we also need to think about the city as a whole and how the pieces of the city fit together. And I think that's one of the things that uh, the BRA and, and a good planning process mm -hmm. can bring about. I, you, you talked about you know, the, the kind of, you know, neighborhood, whether it's a neighborhood, community, whatever, where uh, all those kind of elements are placed in, in place or at least uh, appear to be in place. And where, where could we find some place like that in your travels around the world, around ah. the city, around the, where, where have you find, uh, found uh, uh, cities or neighborhoods or communities where they really kind of pulled all those elements together to make it uh, the livability uh, you know, that much better. Well, of course, it, it varies from place to place. Barcelona is a wonderful and fun city. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone loves Paris. Uh, uh, people love to go to Portland, Oregon to take a look at the transportation systems there and Seattle, for example. Mm -hmm. um, people find it easy to get around a place like Washington, D.C. Uh, depending upon the issue that we're looking at, there are a lot of places around the world and a lot of places around uh, the United States where we can draw upon some of the best practices that have been employed in those cities. And we can also take a look at the good stuff that happens in Boston. I often tell people that if they were to walk down Commonwealth Avenue during the holiday season, and look at the way the trees are lit, or if you go to the Esplanade, right? Or if you get out to some of our, our beaches in the city, or if you go to certain neighborhoods where there's a certain charm within the neighborhood. If you found that kind of neighborhood in a city outside of Boston, you'd say to yourself, boy, I wish we had some place like that in mm -hmm. Boston. And the fact is that we do. So there's much that we can learn from the things that have gone very well <coughs> in some of our neighborhoods, and then we can try to replicate that in others. I, you know, I, I keep thinking, of, of course, uh, they just opened a new tea station in Somerville, and mm -hmm. there's some uh, pretty dramatic changes going uh, taking place there, and extension of the Green Line, uh, just uh, uh, the uh, Union, you know, Union Square, some of the other uh, squares where they've become you know, very kind of trendy, they're working on different open spaces, et cetera, et cetera. Are, are we behind the curve here in, in Boston? And I, and I know that's an oversimplification, but uh, uh, because we are sometimes so insular? Well, we're uh, ahead uh, in... Or did we, uh, you know, are we running behind, so to speak? Well, I think we're ahead in some respects and behind in others. Uh, uh, you know, we've, we've needed to lengthen the hours of the MBTA, for example, because yeah. of the way people live and work now. And that took a long time. Well, we're getting caught up on those kinds of things. But you go into other neighborhoods and, and you think to yourself, boy, this is really exciting. When, when you walk through the Fenway these days, for example, and you feel the, the sense Tough. of energy and the Talk music. About cranes. And, and uh, cranes yeah. going up, but yeah. also uh, students and musicians uh, music coming out everywhere, theater everywhere. Uh, when you're on the Avenue of the Arts and you look at the connections that can be made between schools and museums, uh, when you look at uh, the vibrancy that exists, for example, uh, in many parts of Dorchester and in many neighborhoods, when you look at the film series that has gone on, right. for example, in Chinatown outside, uh, in the little plaza there, 
There are exciting things happening all over this city. And to a large extent, uh, many of those exciting things involve local art, local culture, mm -hmm. local creative people, and we don't know enough about all of those kinds of activities so that more people can share in them. And I think one of the challenges is going to be to really spread the information on all of that uh, in a way that makes the city much more accessible and open to all of the mm -hmm. people who live within it. Kind of pull those pieces together. Again, uh, uh, Ted Landsmark is uh, the newest member of the Boston Redevelopment Authority Board. Uh, of course, he is uh, uh, President Emeritus of the Boston Architectural College, uh, well known uh, in the city of Boston amongst many people, and loved, I should say. Um, there's been some, uh, some criticism of the BRA, and uh, no surprise to you, uh, you know, a lot of it having to do with uh, uh, you know, planning and development, uh, uh, and this is an oversimplification, but uh, uh, being too chummy, that there, there, there isn't really a plan. I think most, most of the criticism is more on planning. They've, there's been a lot of development over the years, but uh, whether it's been planned appropriately, yeah, there is an and, and audit. Now, that, how, how are you feeling about that? Do you see any of that uh, from the outside and now uh, more to the inside? Well, there's already been uh, an audit of many of the internal management practices and steps uh, are being taken to address the, uh, the issues and uh, concerns that were raised there. There's a second audit um, uh, that uh, will go on uh, in relation to the planning processes and the extent to which those processes have been open and transparent and made known to all of the people who might be impacted or might have something to say about those. Um, that uh, a second audit uh, isn't done yet, but it will be. Uh, we'll take a look at that. But we're not going to wait for that second audit in order to move forward to begin to engage more people in the city. When the mayor was elected, uh, he did a series of forums, as you well know, okay. all across the city, and thousands of people came out to express their interest and concerns in dealing with a whole range of issues, development and parks and the schools and what have you. And many of those issues tie back into how we plan for the future of this city. How many people will live here in the year 2020 or the year 2030, and what will the demographic mix be? What will the income mix be? How are we going to deal with issues of income inequality? Right. And the mayor um, has come out forcefully in terms of trying to address those issues and dealing with education around that. All of that takes planning. And a lot of that planning is physical planning. It's planning for neighborhood space, for housing, for transportation infrastructure, for where you put your retail. Um, we're on the cusp of a, really a new era for this city. And we're very fortunate because there's a lot of investment that is available to be made. We have the opportunity not to think in a sense of crisis about how we want to look forward, but really in a more visionary sense about what we want the city to be. And the BRA is going to play a role in that. Uh, a role that's uh, not so tied to, you know, uh, personal ambitions or personal animosities and so and of course you know some of what you're saying not so long ago might have been uh, akin to blasphemy uh, <laughs> and no no uh, no connection to my prior guests here uh, uh, but does it have that feel can you uh, can you feel that there's an openness to kind of looking at these things differently now absolutely uh, right. you know mayor menino accomplished a great many things and the city has changed dramatically in the last 10, 15, 20 years. We can now look forward to a, a very different kind of future that uses technology differently, that uses apps differently, that engages people in different ways than we've known in the past, that uh, really takes advantage of a sense that the city is vibrant, it is global, it is diverse, uh, it is proud of itself, and at the same time, it has an identity which all of us can participate in shaping. And uh, from the perspective of, of the BRA board, there are ways that we can gather information and assemble it and then apply it 
in ways that help neighborhoods to uh, better identify themselves and their needs, and then to have the city respond to those needs in a way that's very forward-looking. Well, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the life of the city uh, you know, involves revolves around a lot of different factors, but so much of a perception of the city uh, still goes back to the bricks and mortar uh, that uh, uh, make it up. And, uh, you know, there's some pretty dramatic proposals that are being brought forth. There's uh, some uh, major developments, as you said, that have been in the pipeline that are coming forth, uh, uh, not the least of, uh, you know, uh, downtown crossing, uh, uh, you know, government center, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, uh, among them, uh, you know, Harbor Towers now yes. being proposed, and we could see even more dramatic developments down along the waterfront and, and in that area. And the bricks, yes, yes, and and the bricks and mortar are uh, certainly a key part of it, uh, but so is glass and concrete okay. and new ways of thinking about building, building more sustainably, um, and remembering that at base. Uh, a city is, is remembered because of the way it's experienced. There are cities around the world that have great architecture, and yet you don't necessarily feel yeah. as though you've experienced something wonderful. Mm -hmm. And when you leave a place, the, the thing you remember a little bit is the architecture, but the thing you remember most is the experience that you had mm -hmm. in that city and how that experience was facilitated by your ability to get around, your ability to be there with your family, the ability to see young people interacting with seniors. So you, you, any, you ignore those things at your risk if that's you're, if you're absolutely planning for right. the future, right? When you're planning for the future, you have to think about who will be there, and you don't always know that in mm -hmm. advance, and what the experience will be for them. Is the city a place where people leave with a sense of joy? and a sense that they have really experienced something that they want to go back to experience again, and that's what we want in Boston. Well, uh, of course, there's a lot of development, and, and uh, uh, you know, I should, uh, I would be remiss not to mention what's, what's happening in, in Dudley Square, on the, the uh, now the uh, bowling building, and uh, no longer the Ferdinand building, or will be, uh, uh, but, a lot of our attention is focused on downtown because it is kind of a focal point. There's a lot of new development that involves uh, certainly uh, uh, you know, mixed use, including residential. Is that, in your mind, uh, having the desired effect in, in terms of uh, kind of injecting that life uh, into the city, uh, an experience that makes people want to come back or live here if they if they aren't already uh, there is there has been an uh, influx of people coming back to the city the city's growing population for the first time is in, growing. In, in years that's uh, right um, I mean it's been gradual but it, it seems to be taking on life of its own well you Agreed? know the the bowling building I think is a, a perfect example um, of how the city can invest in neighborhoods in ways that are creative and innovative and are about building community and creating opportunities for people. Uh, architects from abroad and from the Boston area came together. I had the good fortune to be on the selection panel that selected uh, those architects. They took an old building and uh, married it to a brand new sustainable it's building really, it's really and incredible. it's being used for school headquarters and retail and community space. That's the kind of public infrastructure investment that really benefits the entire community and the entire city. And to the extent that one can then uh, facilitate uh, having uh, mixed use housing, affordable housing in the immediate area, to the extent that you can bring in cultural institutions, the city grows from within itself and not only in the downtown. All right, we've got just a couple of minutes left. What do you see as the city's greatest need at this point and what is, do you see as its greatest strength right now? Well, the greatest need, I think, is to address issues of income inequality mm -hmm. um, and uh, of the large differential that's now mm -hmm. taking place as between the people who want to live here and need to live here 
and the people who can afford to live here. And that's something that we nearly, will clearly need to address through a bunch of interventions. It's not just about affordable housing, it's really about uh, managing student housing and a range of other things. Mm -hmm. The greatest strength is the diversity of the people, the talent, the colleges that are here. Um, we have for uh, what is really a fairly small city an incredible wealth of intellect and talent across the neighborhoods. And that talent um, is in the craftsmen and artisans, it's in uh, the people who uh, work within our infrastructure, it's uh, the people who've been here a long time and know the neighborhoods, it's, it's all the people who run retail, and it's also the people in the colleges and universities. And to the extent that we can bring those together and really use that talent, the city will continue to grow and prosper. Are you surprised at that? Uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, you've got a long history in the city, and, and not, that's, uh, not all of us have such pleasant memories, especially <laughs> this uh, 40th anniversary of the uh, uh, defeg order, and, you know, of course, uh, uh, you became an unwilling victim in, in part of that, and I know you've, uh, you've uh, moved on and made the most of your life, and, you know, we should all be so fortunate, but... Uh, are you surprised that it developed I, that way? You and know, I'm, I'm not just talking about uh, no, I, race, but... Uh, I think that when people in a, in a city have an optimistic sense about the future of that city, the city will pull through tough times. And uh, Boston's been through some tough times, and it's prospering at this moment. And there are other cities in the country that can say the same thing. But it's about optimism, and a faith in the future, and a willingness to trust your neighbors and the people that you're on the MBTA with, and the people you're in school mm -hmm. with, and the people who come to pick up your garbage, and the people who fix your car, and the people you interact with all the time. To the extent that we have a fundamental trust in each other, mm -hmm. and in our ability to make the city better, it does get better. Oh, and what, what is that owing to? Why is that? Is that unique to Boston? To no, you, to, see it, uh, you see that in a, in a few cities around the country. I think, I think it, in part it comes from uh, leadership uh, within uh, political institutions. It comes from leadership from within the faith community. But mostly it comes from people who live in, com in, in communities who are willing to invest their time as much as anything. Mm -hmm in making their communities really work well. And they've hung in. Uh, and they and, hang and in. And made the most. Right. It bodes well for the city of Boston, and uh, we're, I'm so happy to he see you uh, uh, joining the board up there. We have uh, great stuff to do. Yeah, you certainly do. Thank you again. Ted Thanks Landsmark, uh, the uh, newest uh, appointment by Mayor Walsh to the uh, BRA board. Um, well. Uh, look up, uh, look around you, uh, many changes happening in the city, and uh, uh, Ted Landsworth, just one of the people that will be helping to guide them in his role. Unfortunately, we're out of time tonight. Uh, uh, next week, we'll be back. We'll have yet another uh, independent gubernatorial candidate. Uh, Jeffrey McCormick will be joining us. Also, acting superintendent of schools, uh, uh, John McDonough will join us and talk about the, uh, the start of school. Until next week.